<clears throat> so I think this will be the last of my Proverbs. I guess I should, I should say for now, I would love to preach more from Proverbs, but I didn't have a plan to go through the whole thing. So I want to, in this one, um, kind of in this little series of Proverbs today, and then come into something else, but this will by no means be the last of the Proverbs I get preached here. But um, as we come to an end to this one, I want us to consider, I think, just a few more things as we come to the end of this little series uh, here in Proverbs. And I kind of want that proverb right there. Sorry, so it's Proverb 1, uh, 33, which is the one that I quoted right there at the beginning. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. And that's what I want you guys to believe today. I want you to believe that opening verse. That's what I want this uh, kind of to end on. And I want you to ask the question to yourself, what would be the outcome of your life and my life if we forsook that? If we looked at 33 and we said, but we won't listen. We won't listen. And God tells you, you will not be secure. And you won't be at ease. And you will be in fear of disaster. And brethren, to, to put it another way, we could ask this, what is the fruit then of forsaking wisdom? And it's wrapped up in that verse. That's the fruit of forsaking wisdom. And we use this kind of language in Christianity all the time, right? We talk about fruit. And it's often used as a symbol, a metaphor, to describe either the outcome or the result of one's way of life. And we often think of it in this way, in a good way, right? Because the Scripture uses it this way. We often think of fruit like, which is good and right fruit produced by the Spirit. And that's true, and that's through and through biblical, right? The fruit of the Spirit. Something that is produced in the life of someone through the means of God's Spirit. And that's a good thing. But one thing we ought not to forget is there is a counter to good fruit. You think of Galatians, and you think of the viceless in Galatians 5, and then how it's contrasted with the fruit of the Spirit. Brethren, he is telling you, there is an evil twisted fruit that you can produce if you don't produce good fruit. And, and, and so we all need to come to recognize this is we all produce fruit. <laughs> there, there are no fruitless people even outside of the four walls of our church, brethren. There are fruit, fruitless or fruitful people walking the streets of Las Vegas. And it's going to be either good or bad. So for our final section, I, kind, I want to focus us in on this. And I, and I want to do it the way of, you know, uh, Manny read it on Wednesday and I thought it was... Um, we didn't plan that, but very helpful to think of Jesus, one of Jesus' last teachings on the Sermon of the Mount. And he's giving that description of the, of the two houses and what they're built on. And I kind of want us to consider in, in Proverbs, what is somebody's way? Right? We've heard a lot in the Proverbs. I'm not going to even rehash all of it. Be here way too long. Be unnecessary. We'll go listen to them. But as we've considered all that Proverbs has had for us so far, brother, what I want to do for you guys today is I want, you to, I want you to kind of stand back as somebody who's been shown the way, you've been shown the path, and then I want you to also look to your left and look at the path of one who forsakes the wisdom that God has in the Proverbs. I want us to consider the ways or the paths of forsaking wisdom. And there's going to be some stuff in here that's been connected to other ones, but uh, I'm not trying to rehash anything. I simply want us to see more of like, what's the outcome of those things? Like we, we've gone through different warnings of, you know, uh, uh, of being able to control oneself, control one's tongue, uh, being a good worker, a lover of honest work, things like that. But now I want us to consider what would be the outcome of that way of life versus if I forsake wisdom and what's going to be the outcome of a life who forsakes wisdom from God. And uh, as we've been instructed, brethren, in the way that we should go, we ought to consider the path of folly and the path of misery and the path of ruin. Because the Bible holds it out constantly of what sinners end up going down. They end up going down the path of ruin, the path of destruction, the path of misery, bloodshed. Nothing else is in their wake besides misery and disaster. So I have two ways. There's more than two. You could probably find different ways. But I, I, I wanted to choose two as I've been, I've been pouring through the Proverbs the last six months now. The Proverbs and the Psalms. And as I've been in the Proverbs... I, I, I mean, I'm, I would argue these are probably the two most. They're not the only vices. Okay, so hear me out. <laughs> if you want to debate me on this, at least hear my, 
at least hear my premise out on this, they're not the only vices in the Proverbs, the only sins, but they are without a doubt the two most prominent ones that lead to others. They are the two most prominent that lead to others, and they are often the two most that, 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 that create a path for people to walk down, and both of them end in misery. So this first one right here, I've called sleeping one's life away. Now, kind of from the get-go, that seems maybe rather oversimplified. <laughs> like, okay, how much could you talk about sleeping your life away from the Proverbs and say that's one of the main roads towards a path of ruin and misery? And so, let me just say, well, let me make my whole point. Let me make the whole point first, and then if you have questions afterwards, you can, you can press me on it. But I want to argue that... One of the things the Proverbs holds out, and, and, and I don't want you to think these, this is disconnected from other sins. To be asleep, a sluggard in the Proverbs, has a whole train of sins as its cargo. And, and this one is just the head, you know, the, the, the head pulling everything else. And, and, and I want to argue that. So let's, let, let's do this kind of in a simple way first. Let's just deal with what the Proverbs says on its face about being somebody who's a lover of sleep. You know, that's kind of a weird thing to talk about in church. But brethren, listen, especially you who are younger, millennial generation, or even younger, some of you kids, I think this is something that really personifies youthfulness and, 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 and younger people, and especially our generations, was laziness and sleep. And so I, I think everyone in here to some degree can recognize how that can actually be something the Proverbs would warn about. So let's deal with it on its face, but then I want to get a little bit deeper into that idea of sleeping your life away. So first, the proverb says of the sluggard, How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. That's Proverbs 6, 9 through 11. Then I saw and considered it, and I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Proverbs 24, 33 to 34. So you see that the whole book is kind of bookended to some degree by this repetition of this, of the, of this phrase, of the sluggard. When will you get up, sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep and go and do something? Because if you don't, and you say to yourself, just a little more sleep, just a little bit more rest, just a little bit more relaxation, what comes upon you in the middle of the night? An armed robber coming to take everything from you. So, this is obviously not the only defining thing that the sluggard does, right? The, sl the sluggard says a million things. We've actually preached on this before. The sluggard says, I think I preached it maybe. The sluggard says a million different things in the Proverbs, but this is by far the thing he is characterized and says the most. He just says a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. That is his motto in life. Just let me be, let me relax, let me rest, let me sleep. And this, brethren, is the folly of the sluggard. He's a man, as it says in this proverb, he can't even arouse himself from his own sleep and stupor. He is that entranced by his own desire that he can't even arouse himself up from it. He, he's so intoxicated with his love of sleep, his love of relaxation, his love for just ease. Brethren, he can't even arouse himself out. It, it, it's, it's like his love of something has now, as, as we say, his own deeds have turned back on his head. <laughs> what he loves has now becomes the very thing that, is, that he's in bondage to. And brethren, he is a man whose work is, a, is, is simply one of going about continually and resting. Resting, relaxation, sleep, with no consideration at all of what awaits his end. He doesn't think an end's coming for him. He's just going to continually going on resting, continually going on in ease and relaxation and sleep with no thought to the outside world and no thought to his ultimate end. But brethren, it says here, his end 
unlike the passing of his days in slow relaxation and sleep, is going to come very swiftly, and it's going to come suddenly, and it's going to come forcefully, and it's going to be like an armed man robbing him of whatever he has left in his life. And the whole point of that is to say this, brother, when do you know when an armed robber is coming to your door? You don't. And then when it happens, it's all but too quick. And he takes everything from you. And brethren, for this, we need to consider the path and the end of one who forsakes wisdom as it regards rest and sleep. This sluggard is characterized, brethren, listen to this very carefully. I want to be careful in how I word this. Not by sleep, but by a love of sleep, a love of rest and ease and relaxation. I am not condemning going to bed at night and laying your head down. I did it last night. I did get a lot of it, but I did it. You better believe I did it. And I'm not trying to make sure that you don't go home and get adequate sleep so that you can actually get up the next day and not be the sluggard. So hear me out on that. That's not what I'm saying. I think you get at what I'm saying. You know people like this. Brethren, you may have been this kind of person. You may struggle with this now. I am warning about one's longing and obsession of simply wanting to rest and to sleep their whole life away. Nothing ever bothers them except when can I rest? When can I sleep? When can I relax? Brethren, as we know from the last time we were in the Proverbs, the desire of the sluggard kills him. And for his hands refuse to labor, Proverbs 21, 25. And brethren, the reason for it is, is this. The desire of the sluggard is continual sleep, continual rest. So of course it kills him. The very thing he wants cannot produce the, the very thing he wants to enjoy. He wants rest, and he's not willing to work for rest. And you know what he ends up not having in the end? Rest. Disaster comes upon him, brother. Not rest, not bliss. And this is often the case because the fool's desire often outweighs any other desire or perceived need for him to have to go out and do something with his life. He's simply fallen in love with a greater desire, brother, and sleep. Proverbs 20, 13. Hear this one. This, <laughs> when, I was, when I was a young Christian, this one, this one got me out of sleeping until 11 o'clock in the afternoon. Love not sleep lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes, and you will have plenty of bread. Proverbs 20, 13. Brother, not making that verse up. Go check your Bible chapter and verse me right there. Love, not sleep. Brother, just from a glance, what's one thing we can conclude as Christians? What's a path we don't want to go down? Because other things happen to this sluggard. You know what? His desire for rest and relaxation, when work does come along, you know what he says? Oh no, there's a wolf out there ready to devour me and, and, and to take me over. And there's nobody out there. And you know what he says? Oh, I can't lift my hand up to, to put food to my mouth. I'm too tired. I can't do anything. Brother, that sluggard has so many other things that he has excuses for. But what we see just from the glance, brethren, is this sleep ought not to rule us. Not because it's simply a character trait or it's some little thing we shouldn't allow rooted in our lives. Brother, this is a path. To say we love sleep is to be on the path of laziness. It's to be on the path of the sluggard. Brother, and the sluggard in the Proverbs is a fool. He's a fool. Because he has everything in front of him telling him otherwise. And he won't let go of his desire to rest. His desire to sleep. The path of one who loves only rest, relaxation, and sleep. Brethren, believe it is that of destruction. That is what the scripture says. It's destruction, it's disaster coming upon you when you least expect it. And listen, everybody in here, this goes for boys and girls, men, women, young, old, it does not matter. Work has been given to us by God as our part and who we actually are. We were made as image bearers to work before the fall. <laughs> You are to till the earth, brethren, in joy and in fruitfulness, both men and women working together. you got to think like that. I was actually created to work. The reason why I toil and hate work on Wednesdays when it's 108 is because of the curse. 
Not because God has like shoved me into a mold and I just can't stand being a worker. Brethren, you were made to work. You had been given it to by God. It's literally a part of your DNA as an image bearer of God. And brethren, it's diligent and faithful work unto the Lord that leads to honor and glory. Listen to this, not sleep. You know who rests ultimately in exaltation? Hard workers who work unto the Lord in faith for honor and glory. It's not sleepers. Sleep is not the characteristic of those who share in the sufferings and worth of Jesus Christ, brethren. But listen, that seems like, all right, that's a great proverb. (laughs) That seems like regular life. And that is, the proverbs get right down nitty-gritty into the dirt right here on earth. (laughs) They're for us in the now. But the Bible extends this, and I really want you to listen to this, because I think the Bible holds out to us even further into the New Testament, what this kind of path leads to spiritually. That it goes deeper than simply, what do I do with my hands? Or what do I do with, you know, my work and my job? What do I do with my home, brother? And it goes way deeper than that of being a sleeper. Because you could think to yourself, well, I do none of the things that you just said. And brother, the Bible would hold out to us, you can be a sleepwalker, as I'm going to call it. You could be sleepwalking your whole life still being a sleeper, and still being diligent with your hands. And the Bible draws this out. I think there's a correlation here between the sluggard, the fool who loves sleep, and those, as the Bible would say, who fall asleep to righteousness and who are walking towards destruction in its truest sense. So let me give you a couple examples. So in Jeremiah, this is right at the end of Jeremiah, and right at the end of Jeremiah is you get Jeremiah telling the people about Babylon, What's going to happen to them when Babylon comes in and takes them? Babylon's going to end up swallowing them like a fish. This great, this great sea monster is going to come in swallowing the people. But then God is, he makes it abundantly clear, Oh Babylon, don't you think you're going to get out of this unless you honor me? And he tells them in Jeremiah 51 what's going to end up happening to Babylon. And so this is, this is God's warning here about what's going to happen to Babylon. And this is a mark, listen, This is a mark of their judgment using some of this analogy of sleep, a metaphor of sleep. So listen to this. While they are inflamed, this is speaking of Babylon, I will prepare them a feast and make them drunk, that they may become merry, then sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake, declares the Lord. I will bring them down like lambs to the slaughter, like rams and male goats. Jeremiah 51, 39 to 40. So brethren, listen. (laughs) He says, how is he going to prepare Babylon for the date gray of their slaughter? Because they have not obeyed Yahweh and they have been cruel to his people. He's going to prepare them like a fattened calf. And he parallels that with saying, I will put such a deep sleep on them. They are not going to awake from this sleep. Now, did everyone in Babylon fall asleep one night and then they come in and get slaughtered? No, that's not how it happened. When we realize how this happens in Daniel, what happens after Nebuchadnezzar is not in the story? All of a sudden we get uh, Belshazzar, right? What is he doing? Brethren, they're there in their feasting and drinking and acting all merry when their city is about to get sieged, when an armed robber is about to come upon them swiftly because now they are the one who's at sleep. Brethren, they weren't at sleep because they were lazy. Oh, Babylon was not lazy, brethren. I could give you a history podcast about all the things that Babylon did. It's about four hours, so you better buckle up. But they were not lazy in their physical abilities. And the Bible says that a sleep will come upon them, and that sleep will be a curse. And brethren, it's because this kind of sleep goes beyond simply being lazy and wanting to not... uh, you, you use your hands and your feet to do things, brethren. It's, it's to not love righteousness. It's what happens for those who fall asleep to doing what is right, to bringing about what is right. And Paul makes this very appeal to Christians in, the, in Romans, brethren. He, he says it like this in regards to you walking in the day. He says, besides this, you know the time. And then he talks about the time. That, so what's the time? That the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. 
The day is at hand. He's saying, wake up. It's near. It's now. Wake up. And he's not telling them, make sure you set your alarm clock so you get up. He's telling them to wake up. Salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is gone. The day is at hand. Let us then cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. And then he goes into all of it. Romans 13, 11 to 14. So, church, listen. This principle then extends into something that is much deeper. It's not less than the first principle, but it is greater than the first principle. This extends way beyond simply what we can do with our hands and what the Proverbs would hold out to us. Is there a correlation to being lazy and not doing things physically and being a lover of sleep? Oh yeah, there is. You, t you, you show me the Christian who is lazy, and you also will have to show me the one who needs to hear Romans 13 that says, Wake up, Christian. Wake up from your stupor and sleep. Do what is right. Love righteousness. And brethren, hard work is a part of righteousness about what's doing right. But brethren, listen, it is very well the case, too, that you can do what is right physically with your hands and be diligent, be diligent at something, and yet you have fallen asleep to righteousness. Rather than the American church is an example of that. Oh boy, we look so productive here. And abortion in this country has run rampant for 60 years. Rather than we've been busy about all the wrong things and we have fallen asleep. Rather than the scriptures are not only concerned that you're not lazy physically, but more importantly, you're not lazy spiritually. That you don't sleepwalk your way towards destruction. Because brethren, listen, you don't sleepwalk your way to the kingdom. What's that passage we read there in Hebrews? Take off, throw off every sin and wait so you can do what to the kingdom? Rather than run. You're running towards this thing. This is a race. This isn't a sleepwalk. This, this is not daydreaming towards the kingdom. Brethren, you don't want to sleepwalk your way towards destruction. You think about a couple of analogies that even Jesus himself gives. Jesus, when he talks about the two men there in Matthew 7, or even the parable of the ten virgin, I was reading these again the other day just thinking, man, this really, just, it, this fits. So you think about the first one, right? In both, when you're reading them, the issue in both of them is not that somebody's not doing something, right? It, it, it's not that one man built his house on the rock and the other just laid out on the beach and enjoyed the winds and the waves, right? That's not it. In the, in the parable of the ten virgins, is not that some brought all of their oil for the lamps, even if the journey was prolonged, and the others just said, ah, we don't need oil, you, you know, whatever, life's good. That's not how it goes. It goes beyond simply, did somebody put in simple effort? Brethren, the man who fell, listen, the man who fell in Matthew 7, he did what with his house? He built it. He was not lazy. Not by worldly standards. Not, not by the naked eye was he lazy. And the five foolish virgins, brethren, did they bring oil or not? Oh, they brought oil. You better believe they knew he's going on a journey. We better bring some oil. We'd be foolish to not bring some oil. Brethren, what is the difference? It's their sloth and their slumber and their sleep was not that they refused work altogether, but they refused to do so in light of Christ and God's revelation. They were asleep to righteousness. They heard the words that Christ said, that if anyone come and build upon me, if anyone come to me, you'll give him rest, right? And they hear that and they think, nope not going to be awake to righteousness. I'll sleep on that one because they don't think it's going to come about. Their sloth and their slumber, brethren, their sleep is they refused to do things in light of God and Christ's revelation. They were what we call, as I said, these brethren are wishful thinkers. I'll keep going on and it'll be okay. And brethren, how many times have you talked to someone out on the street? And they'll just, they're just waiting. It's a, a different day. I'll do it a different day. It'll be okay on the day. What are you going to do when you face God? I don't know, but I'll be okay. Brethren, no, 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 no. 
That, that, that is when the sluggard is convinced of his own lies, of, of when he avoids counsel, and he thinks his own advice and counsel is wise in his own eyes. That's what happens to somebody who refuses God and Christ's revelation. Brethren, they start to fall asleep to righteousness. They don't think it's of any use. They don't think it's a, if it's any value. They're just wishfully thinking. They refuse to plan and work and operate in faith and in accordance with the promises of God. The only way that they were going to, to operate was by their own whims. They didn't think about their ultimate end. They didn't think about the promises of God, and they did not consider His warnings. And brethren, listen, what a sad reality. What a sad reality. What a bleak path of life that leads to. Look at it. Brethren, you have been so blessed. I have been blessed. We have the words of life, the path of Christ held out to us. And if we sleep on this, Brethren, we are fools. Look at the path. God doesn't hide at the end of the path like it's showered in light, only that when you get to the end of it, there's a bunch of warning signs that says, too late. Everything above that path says, don't come down here. Don't go and traverse this path. Dead end, cliff ahead. Stop, stop, stop. God is not trying to trick anybody. He is not a demonic schemer trying to make you think one thing only to reveal and rip the sheet off at the end and say, surprise. Brethren, think about that life. Look at that path. Think about people who have done that. Think about your own family who have died and said, tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll consider that tomorrow. You think about the Christian who makes shipwreck of their faith. And they said, tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. And they become asleep to righteousness. Brethren, I would rather you be lazy in other places than be asleep to righteousness. You could be busy. You could be moving. You could be working. You could be hustling. You could be diligent. But brethren, all for the wrong thing. And then God says of you, you were sleeping, you fool. Brethren, do you think about that? You fool, you were sleeping. And I told you. And you were busy about everything else, and you were sleeping. Brethren, just think about that. It struck me how busy I have been. And I was a fool. And then you hear Hebrews 12 again. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, brethren, who are not fools. Oh, they look so foolish to the world. Abraham left Ur. He left the busyness. He left his riches. He was a man. And he left it. Brethren, and he was no fool. He was not asleep to righteousness. Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater than the treasures of Egypt. Brethren, he was not a fool, though his hands were... were he, as we thought about last week, the man probably led great campaigns for Egypt, won much land and territory and fame for all the gods of Egypt. And he said, that's rubbish compared to knowing Jesus Christ. Lay aside then, brethren, every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, brethren, he had joy set before him. Oh, you better believe nobody has ever run or worked or been diligent with his hands than Jesus Christ, the man of God. And brethren, it's because he had joy set before him that he endured things that made him look like he was not going to prosper. The cross, shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. Who's wrong now? Who is wrong about Christ now, brethren? All the ones that He put to open shame when He was seated at the right hand. And brethren, that same will go for you. You look at the desire to be a lazy, sluggish Christian spiritually. Yes, brethren, if you have laziness at work, put it away. That's not righteousness. You have laziness at home, sisters, put it away. Children, you have laziness towards your parents, put it away. But you know what? You look to Jesus and you don't be lazy there. 
He goes, brethren, you will. You will if you run this race well. Christ is an open and sure promise to everybody in here. You will see at the right hand of the Father with him. You will be co-heirs with him. So this second one, then the second path for us, I'm going to call the path of immorality. Not immortality, immorality. The path of immorality. And I haven't really been able to talk about this one a lot, so there's by no means am I going to be able to even touch everything the Proverbs have on this one. And um, for some of us in here, I know some of you are younger, and I think you guys have kids. This is touching a subject that the Bible holds out that we have to talk about. Um, this will not be graphic. This will not be crude or anything. But when the Bible speaks, we need to let the Bible speak, and we need to be able to speak openly about some of these things. Brethren, why is there so much wisdom and instruction given in regards to sexual immorality? Brethren, the reason is this. When we look away from the path of laziness and the sluggard and we look to this one, it's because it's so tempting and deceiving. I mean, it's, it's that easy. You could ask anybody, why is that such a temptation for people to walk down? Brethren, because it's enticing. It, it really is. For you to deny that that path is not enticing, Brethren, I think it's for you to be either foolish or a liar. Its end and its destination, we know, are devastation and destruction for all who walk it. But, brethren, we all know the pull to this path is great. It is strong. Proverbs 5, 15, 18. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be for yourself alone, not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. Now, brethren, listen, we, we read something like this and we think, okay, these principles and the Proverbs here, these are directed at sexual immorality and they're dealing with people then who are either their husbands or wives and they're married or people who are planning on doing that and I'm not planning on doing that right now or I'm not married right now or I'm older and this isn't, the struggle it once was when I'm young. And let me just, listen, I know of all the excuses because I used to have some of them too. Just hear this. Because when this king is instructing his son on how he's going to rule well, he's not instructing a king already. He is instructing the kind of man he ought to become in order to become a king. So brethren, whether you get married or you don't, whether you're married now or you're not, whether you are instructing your own kids or not, brethren, this is vital for you because this is actually the kind of person you should grow up into becoming in order to be eligible for any of those things later, right? We don't become eligible for these things later when we decide to do them. God wants to build you up right now in these things. So this is for you. And as we're going up into maturity, brethren, we need to consider that we ought to to be on the highest guard when it comes to sexual immorality. I cannot begin to tell you after reading the last Bible plan how many times it's sexual immorality that leads the people of God astray. Brethren, in fact, oh, man, let me just say majority of time, not all the time, majority of the time, th it's in there somewhere. There's something is mixed up. The people of God led away by or into sexual immorality that brings about idolatry and every other kind of sin. And it's through sexual immorality. And as we're kind of thinking about this then, I want to do kind of the same thing. Proverbs discuss this in very bleak, straightforward, just doesn't hold anything back. Just It's very straightforward with these. So let's just deal with what it says right on the surface of this, and then we can get a little bit deeper into this. I want to first here begin with, I think, probably the clearest and probably the foremost principle, and it's this. The Proverbs locate for us right away where the right place and the wrong place for sex is. All right, two Proverbs here. One we already read. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. What's the parallel verse say about that? Where is, who's the cistern? Who is the flowing water from your own well? Well, brethren, to the man, it's his wife. Makes it very clear right there in those, in those passages. So that's Proverbs 5.15. Here's another one. 
Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? Proverbs 6, 27 through 28. And that, brethren, is in the context of the adulterous woman. And here's what follows it just a few verses later. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. He will get wounds and dishonor, and his disgrace will not be wiped away. Proverbs 6, 32 to 33. So, brethren, can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned or walk on hot coals and his feet not scorched? And the answer is no. A big, fat no. Not ever possible. Brethren, these are just some basic, on-the-surface verses that tell us a few things. First, the desire to drink from your own cistern is for you men and women in this, is for you to find satisfaction and enjoyment only in your wife and vice versa, your husband. So listen, this is not what, what you need to hear from something like this when we're thinking about uh, this principle and when we're thinking about the path that leads to destruction, about chasing the adulterous woman or for in fact an adulterous man, what you are chasing is satisfaction in something else. Because this command right here doesn't come to us, it's just God's not saying, hey, just make sure you don't do this, but if your heart's not there, it's not a big deal. Just make sure you, you know, hands off and you're good. And, and, and even the Proverbs here, are, are they, they want more from you than simply don't go after that woman or don't go after that man. But then they, they want you to desire. They want you to be satisfied in, to enjoy the one God has given you. I mean, you think about that. Can you say with your spouse, and I'm not saying here, do it at home when no one else is here, that's private. But you ask each other, you think about each other, am I just keeping the command to only touch them, to be with them, for the marriage bed to be undefiled physically, but my mind and my heart and my desires and emotions are somewhere else or with someone else? Or do we look at this and go, I find my enjoy, I mean, you think about this, I'm not trying to get graphic or weird. Do you enjoy your spouse in that way? I, I mean, is, is, is your marriage bed one where you come in, like it's your, the well of your city in your town, in your home, and it's just like, got to scoop up some water again because I got to, you know, I got four kids are all thirsty and want seconds and thirds all the time. Got to bring water home to them and to the wife. Or are you going in to draw water out because you know just how refreshing and enjoying and satisfying is cool water from your own house? And brethren, those are two different things. Those are two different things to hear the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, and to hear drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Brethren, is our marriage beds, sisters, is our marriage beds characterized by that enjoyment and satisfaction with each other in covenant with one another? Because, brethren, listen, this has been made and designed by God to, one, safeguard you and to keep your marriage bed holy. But it's also to do another thing. Yes, it's, it's guardrails, praise the Lord. Right? Keeping the boars out of the vineyard, praise the Lord. Not allowing things to come in to disrupt your marriage externally. But brethren, it was also designed. God didn't just go, here, I'm going to keep this barren little patch of dirt. I just want to keep it untainted. No, brethren. What, he's, what he is guarding off in the middle, what he is trying to enclose for you to protect, is a fruitful vineyard, a vine, a garden for you to come in and to eat the fruit and to enjoy it. Like, you see that? God's just not like, let me protect something, but it's, re it's really not that important, whatever we're protecting. It's just we protect this. No, brethren. It, the marriage bed is the place of fruitfulness and gladness. That's where it's found. That's how God's designed it for you in marriage. That is where that culmination happens. And Christians, we need to be unrelenting in our convictions about this. And we also need to cultivate our, our emotions towards this. Don't think you can, you can do this emotionless in your marriage, emotionless in your life. But then even as you're raising up and training up your kids and you're giving them commandments and you're telling them, like the same way the Proverbs does, sons, daughters, listen to me. Don't go after women and don't go after men like this. All right? 
But you also got to tell them the reason why is because when you don't do that and you seek after one who loves Christ and you guys come together in covenant, that is where fruitfulness abounds. That's where gladness and joy abounds. And yes, that is where satisfaction in enjoying the other person abounds. But it abounds nowhere else. And you have got to believe that. And it has got to be clear. Brethren, we don't want to just combat worldly philosophies. Who cares if we keep every worldly philosophy out of our church, out of our homes, out of our bedrooms. And yet, brethren, we get entangled up internally in our own bedroom because we don't desire and we're not satisfied and we don't find any fruitfulness in our own marriage bed. I mean, who cares, right? <laughs> you kept out the world and there's no fruitfulness in your own life. Brethren, that's because sin so easily entangles. The reason the principles and warnings, brethren, are given is because the temptation and the path. Brethren, this one is probably the most well-worn in human history. Men and women have plunged headlong into sexual immorality, and they often ran doing it. And so, brethren, listen, there's only two things to be warned of. Outside of marriage, sex entangles every single time. There's never a caveat. There's never, there, there's never an asterisk saying, well, in this situation, it's okay. No, brethren, listen, sex outside of marriage, it entangles you because it is sin every single time. But brethren, listen, inside marriage, the forbidden woman entangles even more and every time whether it's the one you see or the one in your heart. Every time it entangles, every time that sin will choke you out. Sex must be only for marriage and must stay then within the marriage bed. Brethren, we have got to be focused both on the external and on the internal of our affections. And these two warnings, brethren, are, are, are stark here. Listen to these. Keep your way far from her. I want you to think about that. Sometimes we read these, and listen, I could always do a better job reading the scriptures, but when we read the scriptures up here, and when you're reading it at home, I want you to think about it like you're the parent in here instructing a kid, so you don't go, keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door. Brethren, stop. Listen. When you read this and you think about it, you think about, I'm a parent, and I know who that woman is, or I know who that man is. Like, brethren, I know who that man was. I was that man. I know what he looks like. So you better believe when I'm reading this to my kids and my daughters, I'm going to go, girls, keep your way far from him. That's how you need to hear it. This is, this is what he's trying to get at for you. Keep your way far from her. And do not go near the door of her house. You hear it like a parent, right? Not, you know, overly scolding, but you hear it. Hear it like a parent. Do not go near the door of her house. Lest you give your honor. You think about your family's honor, your honor, Christ's honor, brethren, all wrapped up together. Your honor to others, your years to the merciless. Lest strangers take the fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life, you groan when your flesh and body are consumed and you say, how I hated discipline in my heart, despised reproof. I didn't listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I'm at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. Brethren, you think about the shame he is talking about. That ain't the congregation of sinners. You think about the shame. You think about the ruin that it will bring. Proverbs 5, 18 through 14. Here's another one. And now, O oh sons, listen to me. Boys, listen. Be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. She is not good. <laughs> she is not fruitful. She is a lie. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many, listen, for many a victim she has laid low. Brethren, <laughs> she is a devourer of men. She is a beast. And vice versa. I mean, there are men out here like this too, eating up and spitting women out. Many a victim has she laid low. All her slain are a mighty throng. Brethren, she has an army of the slain <laughs> at her disposal. Her house, brethren, her dwelling place, that's her house, is the way to shale. 
place of the dead, going down to the chambers of death, Proverbs 7, 24 to 27. Brethren, even if all we had was the bare commandment to not go out and do it, would you hear that and not go do it? Would it be enough? I mean, we talked about this the other day when we were in group. Like, God always desires your affections. He always desires your sympathies. He always desires your heart. But what good would it do to simply, you heard your father's instruction to not go do something, and your heart's ready to go do it, and you remember your father's word, son? That's death. And you go, I'm not going to do it because my dad told me that was death. Maybe your heart's not in it. Maybe your affections are not oriented right. But at least, at least on the bare surface, it kept you from something devastating. But brethren, listen, we want more than that. That's not the Christian life. And that's not all. Listen, that's not all the Proverbs hold out on this one and how it bleeds into the New Testament. So I want you to hear this. If you grow up, Listen, especially us men in here, boys, men who have grown up in an age of computers and internet. Listen, I grew up in it. I know what it did to me. When you grow up dominated by sexual perversion, it will have long-lasting and destructive consequences. Brethren, even when the Lord redeems us, and He has brought me out of a lot of filth, and brought a lot of things that had to be undone in my Christian life, thinking about people differently, thinking of all sorts of things differently, having to bring that even into marriage, having to work on how I think about things, how I operate in things. Brethren, it has a long lasting, it is like a poison that just goes right down to the root. And you got to go all the way down and and get right to the root of it. You got to be radical in that sense. Get down to the root. Because this thing goes deep. And the attraction, brethren, listen, this is the pull of it. This is why it seems so good in the moment. The attraction seems so great because it is so enjoyable. It's just like how it says this woman is. Her words are sweet as honey. They taste so good in the moment. And when you're young, listen, when you're young, I'm still young, with youth, the idea of it ever being fleeting and gone will never occur to you. Just, just... When you hear that, don't, don't hear an older person saying, you're young and you just don't know, it's going to go away. It's like, and you go, yeah, yeah, whatever. Well, you know what you end up doing the older you get? You're like, dang, my dad was right. My mom was right. They, like, they, they knew. And most of the time they knew because they did the same things that I want to go do. So when you're young, you think, I'm always going to be young. Life's just going to keep going on the way I am right now. I'm always young. I'm always going to prosper. I'll always be satisfied with this. It'll never change. And the Proverbs show you something else. You know what happens when age comes and your youth flees and the attractions are gone? And guess what? You're not a stud anymore. Or ladies, you're not the, you're not the flower of the field anymore. Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? But there in Proverbs 6.26, hear this, says that the price of a prostitute is only a little compared to that of a married woman. So I don't think he's saying, don't go after the prostitute, then go after the married woman because the prostitute's cheap. Like, okay, there's a truth to that. Going after someone who's married and being discreet is definitely a little bit of a step up than going out into the street and handing a woman money and, and trying to have a relationship with her, right? So Proverbs 6, 26 says, all right, the price of the prostitute's only a little. And you know what the person thinks? It doesn't... This doesn't cost as much as he said. It's nothing, right? It's nothing. But their youth flees, right? Their their attraction flees. And you know what? Now they can't seduce. Now they got to go pay for this thing. Now in order to get their fix and their pleasure, they got to go out and they got to pay somebody for this. But then you will seek out your pleasure through other means and through finances when your ability to achieve them starts to run dry. You will do whatever you can to feed this thing. And this is, this, is, this is how sexual perversion works. To get you to go to any lengths to get more. Any lengths. And here's what the Proverbs warn. You may think, oh, this is a really random proverb in Proverbs 29. I want you to think of what we just read in Proverbs 6. The prostitute is cheaper than the married woman. right? She's like just a, a, a loaf of bread. She's barely worth anything. So what's the big deal? Brethren, this man now here in 29.3 is now to the point of ruin. 
29.3 He who loves wisdom makes his father glad, but a companion of prostitutes squanders his wealth. See, brethren, he thought, oh, it's cheap. I can still continue to get this even later in life. Dominated by sin. And it brings him to ruin. <laughs> brings him to absolute ruin. This man is now to the point because he's been dominated by this sin. He's willing to come to ruin in his wealth because he can't live without this sin. This is what this sin does. His vices are like an intoxicating drug. They're like the words of that woman he first encountered. They were sweet and he can never get the same kind of fix again and he's always chasing it. Brethren, but here the wisdom of Proverbs stands beyond and we got this great revealing of this in the New Testament. This thing, of this picture of marriage. Where we ought to find satisfaction in, enjoyment in. And the great mystery here in the New Testament is that marriage pictures what? Pictures the gospel. <laughs> that marriage ends up picturing the gospel. That in the New Testament, Christ gives himself for his bride, the church, and that marriage corresponds to the earthly reality. To your marriage. So when we think of sexual morality, brethren, we are thinking at the same time, and we ought to think this way, unfaithfulness. It is not some bare commandment for Christians. When we think of sexual morality, we ought to also think of unfaithfulness to God. Because God married us, brethren, and He is never unfaithful. So when we think of sexual immorality, when we think of perversions, whether it be outside of us or inside of our heart, brethren, we better at the same time realize there is unbelief and unfaithfulness occurring in the same steps. And the Bible paints the picture of this, that unfaithfulness to God, to Christ, who is our husband, brethren, is actually adultery of the highest level. That's what the people of God were, that's, that's what the people of God were ultimately charged with in the Old Testament. I was but a husband to you, and you were but a bride to me. And you went after and lifted up your skirts and bore your shame to the nations. Brethren, there is no cookie-cutter statement concerning the gospel when it comes to this. This is not Christ died, buried, rose again on the third day kind of thing. That's true, amen. But when it comes to this sin, we need to have that ultimately in our minds. Christ died for His bride and is never unfaithful to you. That is the ultimate grounding and hinge upon which we fight. And then when we look down at that path, we realize what it truly is. Brethren, it is unfaithfulness and it is unbelief. This is the key to unlocking, brethren, freedom from sexual immorality. This is the key to unlocking satisfaction and enjoyment in your marriage bed. It's Christ. And the path to sexual immorality, brethren, is it's, it's actually downstream from another one. That path is downstream from the path of faithfulness to God. You find yourself down at the, at, at the end of that stream in sexual immorality, brethren, it's because upstream you went off that path. You, you left faithfulness to God behind. Brethren, it is, it is the essence of this proverb that we have, when that happens and that occurs, brethren, it says we've simply failed to drink water from the cistern of Christ. We, we have failed ultimately to find satisfaction in Jesus Christ when we, when we, when we find ourselves in this. This is the greater dive of, of, of sin, we, we jump into a pool that is much deeper than we originally anticipated. Lack of satisfaction and enjoyment in God. And brethren, when sexual immorality is chosen, it's chosen because you believe the lie. This is the lie that we believe. We believe the lie that satisfaction is greater and will be found in the thing that we desire. That's the lie. The lie is held out to you. You will find satisfaction in this and not in God. You will find happiness and enjoyment in this and not in Christ. That's what's held out to you every time. It's actually really simple. And sometimes it gets complicated with how it looks and everything that comes up in your heart. But at its base, it's simple. It's either this or Christ. Satisfaction in this or in Christ. Brethren, it's looking at God and it's looking at what He made, what He's designed, and you're just not satisfied with it. You just can't find satisfaction in it. And brethren, you can look at the marriage bed and you can see nothing but restriction. I got a drink for my own sister and I got to stay within this little parameter that God set up for me. 
brethren, you see the adulterous woman or the prostitute or whether it's porn or whatever else it may be, and you conclude satisfaction is in that, brethren, you think that's the right design? That's the lie that's being presented for you? You find it here. That's what it's presenting towards you. You can find that here. Here's the path you can follow. Satisfaction, enjoyment, it's all right here. Just come down this path. Brethren, ultimately what we're saying in our conclusion is this. We're looking at God and saying, you are a liar. We're looking at God and saying, you lied. You're a liar, God. Brethren, sexual sin will make you conclude. <laughs> so, right, is sin rational? No. Sin's not rational. Sin will make you conclude the most irrational and illogical thoughts, like God's a liar. And we know God's not a liar. God can't lie, brethren. He is not a liar. Let every man be made, <laughs> be, be, be made a liar. Brethren, while it's possible to fall in with God's designs, you can, you can, you can kind of stay in the confines and the boxes, be safe. Not, but, brethren, you can at the same time not be satisfying God. That, that can happen. But, brethren, listen to this. The way out of that box is not to keep pressing the rules harder. The way out of that box is to say, let me be satisfied with God. And then everything else will be freedom for me. Because, brethren, no one who is satisfied with God for who He is will ever be dissatisfied for the things God has set in place. They will never look at the restrictions in the marriage bed. They will never look at the world's love of sexual immorality and go, man, I'm just missing out. Or, why can't I have more in my marriage? Why, why, why can't I have some other thing? Why, why, you know, why can't I let my thoughts wander? Why, why can't I look at her or him? Rather than the one who's satisfying God will, will, will never be dissatisfied with what he's told you and what he's designed for you. In fact, you will see it and go, that's the only way for me to be happy. The only way for me to be happy in God is to find happiness in my marriage bed with my wife only. The only way for that is to, is, is to forsake the things that the world offers me. It, it, it's to find satisfaction in Jesus Christ. So church, as we close, <clears throat> look at those two paths. There's obviously more. There's much more that could be said. But those are, those are two of the paths. Those are the two paths held out there and you look at their ends you behold the fruit behold the fruit of forsaking wisdom and instead brethren behold your God in Christ be satisfied in Him be satisfied in Him then brethren listen like that proverb said at the beginning then if you're satisfied in Him brethren you will be at ease without dread of disaster both now and and forever, brethren. Let's pray.